Um, so Kate works for the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. And I first um, heard of her when I was reading, hold on, I have a visual aid, one second. I was reading this book, which if any of you have not heard of it, it's called Eager, and it is the Beaver Bible. It's a really phenomenal book all about how, um, well, the, the many numerous benefits that beavers offer. Um, it's, it's very well written, and Kate appears in here. There's a whole chapter on how beavers can help transform California for the better. Um, and Kate will be talking about that in detail. So that's where I first heard of her. And when I, I checked out her website, I found that she's also the co-author of a sort of um, manual, I guess, of sorts for, um, for beavers in California. And she's going to be talking to you about that and so much more. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Kate. I'm gonna mute myself and looking forward to your talk. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon. And thank you, Escondido Creek Conservancy, for sponsoring this. I love it that you're doing conservation conversations. It's a pleasure to be here. So as Simon said, I work with the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and we are a nonprofit that has an 80-acre demonstration site in Western Sonoma County. And I've been working with this great group of folks for the last 15 years, and we do a bunch of different programs to try to help educate folks, increase folks' ecological literacy, and uh, provide demonstration for folks to see how certain land management practices can be done towards creating more resilient communities. And a lot of that has to do with food sovereignty and watershed restoration, and we do permaculture trainings, and we have a retreat center where folks come and learn and and be in our organic gardens where we seed save and we distribute a lot of those seeds through multiple seed exchanges every year and the list goes on and on and on um, so check out our website if you want to learn more about our center and we've been around for 25 years and still kicking strong even despite the pandemic and i work for our water institute which is focused on the watershed restoration portion and in that work we work with a lot of different folks. So we're working on doing collaborative conservation from Ridgeline to Reef. And we partner with all kinds of agencies and other nonprofits and communities and tribal citizens and so on and so forth to get this work done. And we're really focused on the whole, you know, from the mountaintop down to the ocean because our waters are super precious and everything that lies between uh, has a lot of opportunities for conservation. And we work a lot with um, members of the Sierra Meadows Partnership and the Salmon Restoration Federation to get a lot of this work done on the ground, which is super exciting. and. I'm grateful for that opportunity. And for us, you know, our totem species that we've been working with for the last 25 years is uh, salmon. And for those of you that are fortunate to be living in the midst of fish from the salmon family, uh, anadromous fish, salmonids, they're also called, we're really lucky. They do amazing things, aside from being am amazing fish in and of themselves they are part of what's called the anadromous nutrient pump. So this little map down here shows you these fish, they're born in the headwaters and they come down when they're ready to go out to sea and they gather all of these marine nutrients while they're out at sea over the couple of years that they live out there. And they bring them back and spawn and die. And those nutrients then get reabsorbed by the landscape. So many of our coastal systems have been depending on these marine nutrients coming to them from our salmon allies. And so it's really important that we conserve these fish, uh, whether it's steelhead or in this case, you're looking at a photo of coho salmon, which for us are the fish that we've been working with the most because they are the most threatened in Sonoma County and Northern California in general. And um, they're kind of on their, um, they're, they're having a rough time, you know, similar to your southern steelhead, if those of you are down in, in Southern California, um, their numbers have been plummeting. And so they're on life support right now and we're doing everything we can to support them and really make sure that, that they can survive and thrive and um, become 
flourishing once again. So, you know, this little bar graph on the left here shows you their numbers uh, in Northern California anyway, went from 350,000 down to, quite honestly, they got down to, in our county, about five fish. And so um, it's desperate times and desperate times uh, warrant desperate measures. And so even though there's a lot of incredible folks doing amazing efforts to recover these fish, uh, we still need to think even bigger and get more creative and think outside of the box even further. And so that's where this character comes in, which is our beloved beaver. So we're talking about the North American beaver, Castor canadensis, as opposed to the um, Eurasian beaver. There's only two kinds of beaver in the world and they're native only to the uh, Northern Hemisphere. So if you hear about those beaver down in uh, Tierra del Fuego, they were brought there and they're wreaking havoc because the plants did not co-evolve with them. We can talk more about that later. So, um, and I wanna just give a shout out to, um, you know, in doing our historic ecology work, we were looking for all kinds of evidence of beaver in California. And one of the things we really looked into were, uh, ethnographic evidence and tribal uh, words, you know, native California words for um, beaver. And so uh, we found some Luiseño words and a Kumiyai word, um, and that's pretty cool. So beaver, I'm just gonna talk about beaver first and then we can go more into the restoration and the policy and, and what you can do to help kind of thing. So, if you haven't met beaver before, they are amazing and they are a highly adaptable habitat generalist. They are a rodent, uh, largest rodent in North America and uh, second largest in the world. I'll let you guess later which that one is if you don't know already. And for them, what they need is water and food. And they really want to get access to uh, wood, bark, roots, grasses, etc. And so they'll go, they'll live as high up as tree line. They can live in really cold places. They go as far north as the taiga. Uh, they can live in deserts and do. They're all up and down the Colorado River and in parts of Mexico and Southern California. And they live in cities or uh, undeveloped places. So they're really, really uh, capable of living in all kinds of conditions, which is good news for them and sometimes frustrating for others. Um, they are herbivores. As I was saying before, they really love willow, poplar, family trees. Their aspen is their absolute most favorite food. They will risk their lives for aspen if they can get at it. Uh, but they also rely on a lot of other herbaceous plants and roots and bulbs. Uh, they mow grass. They love grass. And you can see this one beaver in Napa is eating a mouthful right there. And, um, and so there's a lot of folks uh, that believe beaver eat fish. They don't. So they're not going to be competing with our fish. They're actually going to be doing good things for them. So Here's some more cute pictures of beaver. Again, rodent and uh, highly adapted to the water. They've got some really, really special features, including they have, uh, they have a clear interior eyelid. It's a nictating membrane, it's called, so they can see underwater. So they basically have built-in goggles. Um, they have uh, webbed feet so they can swim. They have a claw that's split so they can groom and spread their oil all over their coat to make themselves waterproof. Um, and they live as groups in colonies. This is really unusual for rodents actually. Uh, they live together and uh, the adults, so they have a breeding pair and then they have kits every year, usually a litter of two, six, eight, depending on where they are. And um, and then those kids stick around and the next year they help raise the next batch of kids and then they stick around for another year. And then after two or three years is when the juveniles disperse. And that's when they have to go off and find a new place to live. Most often by water, but they will go overland if they have to. And they have a really special set of teeth. These incisors they're called are where the business is. That's what allows them to chew down trees and fell quite large trees. And um, their teeth keep growing. So they have to keep uh, chewing at things to keep them sharp. And wow, look what they can do with that. Pretty creative, right? So 
We love what beaver can do. And if you haven't seen their chews, you should definitely get out in the wild and find some beaver chews because they do some pretty cool work. So for them, aquatic habitat is critical to their success. They are a very large rodent, average 40 pounds, pure protein with a really fatty tail that makes a very tasty snack for top predators. And so mountain lions, coyotes, bobcats, bear, uh, wolves there and humans are going after beaver at all costs and so beaver have to get really creative to figure out how to have a big den that has an underwater entrance and so you'll see here on the lower left they'll either be going into a bank and doing what's called a bank burrow often under a tree or they'll be doing a lodge which is the lower one on the right where that's kind of out in the lake and you can see in this upper can you all see my cursor nod if you can yes i see a nod yes okay so this is a, a lodge right here right and then if the river that they're in isn't deep enough they're going to build a dam and then folks are like but wait i thought there's only dam beaver you know building beavers or bank building beavers and um the truth is they do it all depending on where they are they're going to conserve energy if they show up in a lake they're just going to build a lodge and then they'll start building canals to get at their food and these canals are amazing. They get really deep and they maintain them quite well. They're quite the industrious critters. So this is the same photo behind me. This is just a picture of if given enough space, beaver will create an entire wetland um, and have a primary dam with a lodge and then secondary dams um, that provide incredible aquatic habitat for many, many different species. But even if they don't have access to a lot of space, they'll show up in cities like the Martinez beaver did and build dams in a very tiny creek, Alhambra Creek, right next to the train station and up against all of this sheet piling in a city right behind the Starbucks, right? Um, and do fine. So again, super adaptable. They, and if you don't know about Worth a Dam and the Martinez Beavers, you should check out their website. They're a great resource and they have a beaver festival every year. So beaver, what we call keystone species, uh, ecosystem engineers, they basically in trying to protect themselves and sustain their lives, they're creating all of this habitat that's disproportionately benefiting a bunch of other species. And for us in California, we have so many uh, endemic species that are only here in California that really benefit from beaver habitat. So working with beaver, partnering with beaver is really important to conserving those species like the Lahan cutthroat trout or our sage grouse or this Cascades frogs or willow flycatcher. All of these species and many other species benefit incredibly from the aquatic habitat that beaver provide. And so when they're building these dams, they have all of these, what we call ecosystem services. They provide all of these uh, benefits. And so they hold the water back and kind of create what's like a sieve. And in doing so, it improves water quality, it traps nutrients, it, tra it can trap toxins, it can help hold things back and make sure that those things um, don't get to its ultimate destination. And so you can help remediate systems by working with beaver dams. And this is a picture of Taylor Creek in South Lake Tahoe. If any have been there, you know this area, it's amazing. And there was a study done that showed that actually the dams, there are many, many dams on the system, they were holding back a bunch of phosphorus. Uh, that was going into the lake prior and, and causing the lake to have poor uh, clarity. And so in actuality, it's not, it, it, we really want to uh, lobby to change the sticker that it's beavers that are keeping Tahoe blue because they're doing a lot of work out there and they're maintaining those dams all the time without any pay or, you know, they're working around the clock. So my hat's off to those beaver. And those dams also help buffer climate extremes. So you can see in the photo on the left, these, all of these series of dams, they end up being like shock absorbers. And so not only do they spread the water out, but they slow it down, they allow it to infiltrate. And then when floods come, it helps uh, absorb that energy from those floods and, and help dissipate the energy. They also can help increase resiliency of wildfire, which 
this is a huge problem, obviously, we're having right now in California. And this is a photo from the Sharps fire in Idaho. And I don't know if you saw the Nat Geo article that just came out that had a picture similar to this. Um, and it was talking about this study that our own Emily Fairfax, who is with CSU Channel Islands in Ventura, she just published this paper called Smokey the Beaver. And it is all about what these beaver wetlands do to increase their wildfire resiliency. And so it's a funny thing, water still doesn't burn. And so if we can figure out ways to keep bigger bodies of water on our landscapes and in our riparian areas, then that's gonna increase our resiliency to wildfire as well. So again, these dams, they're holding that water back. And so that's allowing that water to sit there longer and recharge the groundwater. And what that does in a lot of places, especially higher up in the watershed, it holds on to the water longer and later into the season and then releases it slowly. And so now that we're losing snowpack, uh, it's really helpful to have those kind of assurances higher up in our watersheds to make sure that we have more water longer in our Mediterranean climate. This is a great example of uh, what you can do in a very dry area if you do some creative conservation work. So this is in Nevada, Susie Creek. And this is a project that our colleague Carol Evans was doing. She was with the BLM, she's now retired. But she collaborated with some ranchers and with Trout Unlimited because there are actually some very endangered Lahontan cutthroat trout in this system. And, um, but it's been grazed for years and years and years and it's been incredibly downcut. And so you can see here, this used to be the floodplain up here. And after decades of mismanagement and just year round grazing and whatnot, it started to get down cut. We call it incised. And so now the floodplain is way down here and it's completely disconnected from all of this land up here, which used to be much more lush and hydrated. Meanwhile, the cattle are coming in here and stirring stuff up and eating every green thing in sight, especially in the summer. And it's just the system can't recover. And so what they decided to do was they worked with the ranchers and the ranchers were willing to experiment with just pulling those cattle off in the hot season. And that was it. And sure enough, just by doing that, it allowed the vegetation to start to come back and recover and get a little bit of a advantage over the cows and have some time to rest. And so once this happened, the beaver showed up and they said, well, this is great. We now have food so we can stick around. There's water and uh, we can work with this. And so within a 20 year time span, this is what it looks like now, or at least this is what it looked like in 2012. And it looks even better now. And so, you know, this is amazing. We can actually work with beaver to, you know, by doing the right thing and just making sure that there isn't this competition for food, the beaver can then stick around. This is similar to the story that some of you may have heard about in Yellowstone where the beaver um, were used to be abundant in Yellowstone, but they noticed there weren't as many anymore. And part of it was because the elk had gotten so abundant and they were hanging out in the creeks and they were loafing and they were eating every piece of vegetation because the wolves were no longer there. And once they reintroduced wolves to um, Yellowstone, they were able to start chasing those elk and the elk would no longer stick around as long and they were much more active and so they weren't grazing as much and, and just basically destroying the, the, the uh, riparian vegetation. And so as soon as that happened, the beaver were able to come back. And so this is what we're trying to do in places where we have cattle as well to mimic that called a trophic cascade. So clearly we need to fight incision with incisors because that's like what we best thing we got going right here. And um, I invite you to support us in, in doing that. Um, so a lot of folks ask, well, wait a minute, aren't those dams a barrier to fish? You know, we've got some really endangered uh, steelhead or, you know, coho and we're really worried that they're not going to be able to get past the beaver dams. Well, turns out beavers actually do a lot of great things for fish. Um, we've already talked about how they help make the groundwater get more abundant, um, but they, by reconnecting this uh, creek to its floodplain, 
they expand the riparian vegetation and then they create this off-channel habitat which is really important for the young fish the juveniles because when things get really fast in here they need a place to hide out and not get washed away um, so that's super important turns out dams are quite permeable and juveniles have been uh, studied they put in little pit tags and they've been able to detect them wriggling through dams big fish they jump over dams the haida have a saying that beaver taught salmon to jump and it's true uh fish have learned how to jump and they often can jump over dams or they wait until high flows which is when they would want to move anyway and they move with the water then um, and if you need any more evidence, check out these studies on the side here. There's been a great deal of research done to show the connection between the benefits of beaver and fish. And a lot of folks are focusing on the dams for good reason. They do a lot of amazing things. And this is an amazing study that happened up in the Smith River, which is at the top of the state. Um, dams aren't actually the whole story. Um, they did some, so um, Marissa Parrish, she actually did her master's thesis on this project. And she did snorkel surveys into the beaver bank burrows. The Smith River is quite wide and fast. And so the beavers don't build dams on it. They don't need to, it's deep enough. They're fine without dams there. So they're in bank burrows. And if you see right here in the lower part of this photo, this is right outside the entrance of their burrow. So you know, they, they cut some dinner, they love the little willow branches, they swim home, they bring it into the den to feed to their young, they peel it, they eat all the leaves, and then they push the stick out. And so these piles start forming out of their, um, out in front of their, their burrow hole. And so what Marissa and um, Justin Garwood were able to figure out by doing all of these surveys is that actually there are all of these species that are living in the lodges and in those uh, stick piles. So they're, they're functioning as river reefs and providing all of this protective cover for a bunch of native California species, including coho salmon. So that's really important news. Uh, so for people who, um, get really fixated on dams, we want to just remind that absolutely dams are great and even just burrows and food debris piles are a really important part of the habitat. So given all these amazing benefits uh, and we've been hearing about beaver in other states and the work that they've been doing uh, with fish in particular to recover coho and other endangered salmon species, we decided we got to bring this word to California because 10 years ago when we started this campaign, a lot of folks were kind of not even thinking about beaver or even knew they existed in California. And so we realized that, that there was a void there that we needed to fill. So we started this campaign and my colleague Brock Dolman, who um, couldn't join me on this uh, presentation, poor guy, he's uh, rafting on the Colorado River, uh, checking out beaver in person. Um, so he and I started this campaign over 10 years ago, and we're working to educate folks about the importance of beaver and that the role that they play, and then really trying to support folks in getting engaged and doing citizen science themselves, and then really reaching out to uh, academia to make sure that the studies we need done are being done. Because there's, uh, uh, there's not a lot of research on beaver being done in California yet. We're working on that, as are many others. And then demonstrating the benefits and you know taking folks out on tours and and showing how this uh, restoration works and then ultimately we have to change the rules because if we don't change the rules then it's hard to do the kind of restoration that we want to do so we work a lot on policy change as well so if you don't know about the history of beaver it's a really important part that we educate folks about a lot of folks don't even think beaver are native to california at all which is not true they are native and they were nearly trapped to extinction. Unfortunately for beaver, they have a pelt that has uh, the perfect undercoat that makes felt, really amazing watertight felt that all top hats and many other hats were made of. And so there's a huge demand for their fur for this reason. And not only that, um, they have these castor glands pictured up here that they store the chemicals from the plants in as a way to scent mark. 
but these were harvested to use to make medicine, perfumes, and um, still to this day, they're used for perfumes and also uh, artificial flavors. Uh, so big demand on beaver and um, it's, you know, they trapped them out of Europe first. And then when the settlers came to North America, they found more beaver, lots more beaver. We had up to 400 million beaver across North America at contact. That's a lot of beaver. 10% of the landmass was covered in beaver engineered wetlands as part of the riparian systems. So fast forward, this is how the colonists basically funded their colonization. They were um, trapping themselves, they were buying pelts off of indigenous folks and basically shipping them all back to Europe and Asia for quite, quite a profit. And this decimated beaver. And we lost so many, we have no idea actually. And at this point, we're hovering maybe around 20,000 total. We actually don't know. So um, this is a big question, but we're nowhere near at, at, uh, at the numbers that we used to be. Thankfully, we had some ingenious folks that decided we should start um, moving beaver back into their former, um, areas that they lived in. And so, yes, it's true. They were thrown out of airplanes as part of that effort. Idaho started first, uh, the airborne beavers. You can look it up online. You can see actual footage of beavers being thrown out of airplanes in boxes that had parachutes and the boxes would open on impact. And California did the same thing, of course. We had to get into the game. It just looked like too much fun. And so you can see here that our own department recognized that these beavers are trapped by the department in farm areas where they can damage crops and levees, but they are helping in the mountains to save water for fish, wildlife, and agriculture. So they were aware of their potential um, back then. And this happened in the period of like 1923 to 1950. And this map on the left here, all of these little O's are basically the places where you, uh, where they dropped off beaver. And so, Thankfully, many of our beaver that we have, not many, some of our beaver that we have are as a result of those uh, translocations that happened. And we're grateful that they did that so that we can actually have a beaver population to work with. And so around the same time, with all of this focus on beaver, there was this amazingly exhaustive report written about the status of beaver in California. And in it, uh, Donald Tappy basically uh, based on uh, research that his uh, mentor, Joseph Brunel, who was a famous mammologist, um, he, the two had decided that beaver were only native to the northern part of the state up here in the Klamath Modoc zone, to the Central Valley and to the Colorado River, but nowhere else in the state, certainly not above a thousand feet and certainly not on the coast. The rationale being that there were not is there were it was too rocky, uh, it was too high, there wasn't enough food, etc. And so, still to this day, this informs people's management decisions. We get a lot of folks saying that they're not native, both because they were relocated, but also because of this research that was done in the 1930s and 40s. And back then, there were not a lot of beaver left. California got down to about a thousand beaver, which is a very small amount. And so um, when we saw this and we realized the effect it was having on wildlife managers and how they were treating beaver as a non-native nuisance, we decided we needed to get to the bottom of it and figure out if in fact we could find evidence otherwise. Because it was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. So we did some historic ecology work, as I mentioned before, and we published our results in some peer-reviewed papers. And the kinds of things we found were physical evidence like buried beaver dams above a thousand feet. This is a buried beaver dam that was found in Plumas County and at about a 5,000 feet. And um, the sticks were carbon, radiocarbon dated and three different layers of the dam were dated. And the earliest was from 540 AD and the middle was in the 1700s. And then the top was from 1850. And we know who was cruising around up there in 1850. This was prime gold rush era. So it's likely the beaver were shot and eaten at that point or their pelts were taken. 
And that was the end of that. And so having evidence like that is really helpful to rewrite the history. And then also lots of historic accounts and, um, and ethnographic accounts, like I was saying. And so this map now to the right here is, is our proposed historic range of beaver that we um, are throwing out there. And we are interested if others find more evidence. Um, we've done the initial homework and now we invite everyone else to look for more evidence. Um, you know, the onus seems to get put back on us, but in fact, we'd like to see others who are doubting that beaver are native to find evidence that they are not native. Um, and help us figure this out once and for all. So for those of you in Southern California, this is some of the uh, evidence that we found. Uh, and for San Diego in particular, there was this quote here that was from a David Hoffman report in 1864. And um, you can see that he says that they found amongst all of these animal beavers. And so that's one of the kind of pieces of evidence that we have for San Diego. There was actually a live beaver in the Sespe River uh, up until 1908, I think it was, and it was trapped and killed. Or no, it was found uh, injured and then shot. And so um, Southern California does have native beaver. 1908 was before any of the relocations and any of the, um, yes, before the relocations, that's the key point. So. Um, there you have it. Go check out our papers if you want to find out more. There's lots of good stuff there. So right now with our policy, so the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is the agency responsible for uh, managing beaver in our state and it's the wildlife branch. Even though beaver affect the fisheries branch and the meadows folks and the climate change folks, um, beaver affect all kinds of different branches but Wildlife is the branch that gets to um, set the rules and so, um, or at least decide how they're going to be managed. And thankfully, a law was passed last year that bans the recreational trapping of beaver because before that it was allowed in 42 of our 58 counties. So we can now take that off the plate. Um, and the department has been willing to work with us to put up information about how to live with beaver. So that's been really great to collaborate with them on that. And then there is this other issue though, that's called depredation. So any landowner or tenant who's having a conflict with beaver, um, the beaver is threatening or is actually damaging their property can apply for what's called a depredation permit. And so that means that if they get the permit, they can kill the beaver. And my experience is that these beaver or these permits are, um, because the language says the department shall issue a depredation permit, the department ultimately has to um, in the end. And yes, they can ask them to try alternatives, but they don't, they can't force landowners to try alternatives. In a lot of cases, they don't even try. And so this is where we're really trying to change the policy. And so we're work working right now with some uh, other uh, organization, Center for Biological Diversity and the Environmental Protection Information Center to see if we can get a rule change petition to change the language that then supports the department in having more discretion and especially when it comes to listed endangered species. So right now, if I have a beaver that's building a dam and there's all kinds of endangered species around, I can still kill that beaver. And that doesn't work. We need to make sure that those beaver stay in place if we, if we can keep them there. And everyone always asks, what about relocating them? Well, currently relocation, possession or movement of beaver is not allowed by the department. And they have expressed a lot of concerns around liability, transmission of disease, um, the impacts on the beaver themselves, and then just what happens to the landscape when you move beaver. And I'll talk more. So poor beavers, they would love to get moved around, but right now they're just gonna hang out in the bar and like try to talk it out. Um, meanwhile, we've got this great emerging science, uh, beaver and process-based restoration. And there are a lot of proponents across the arid west that are working on these efforts to really get out on the landscape and figure out how to restore beaver. And there's a bunch of different ways you can go about it. Um, and these are the go-to books if you have any interest, downloadable online, super well-researched and thorough. And um, 
So check them out. Our colleagues at Utah State have done a lot of great work, as have our colleagues um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, and the Forest Service. So one way we can help restore beaver is how about we take care of the ones we have and um, support them in living, you know, support us and our fellow humans in living with them. So coexistence is an option that's been practiced all over the country and it's quite successful. It just takes know-how of what you need to do to outsmart the beaver. And they love culverts, for example. This is a great example of how they're gonna just, it's, for them, it's just a big hole in a dam. And so the road is the dam and this is the hole and they're just gonna fill it and make sure the dam stops leaking. But that's not good for the road. So we need to help uh, our road managers remember that we have things like these trapezoidal fences that we can put in that basically discourages the beaver because they can try to build around it, but it doesn't actually impact the flow. The flow can just go over and go out the pipe. And so they give up. They are not, um, they, they don't wanna waste their precious calories themselves. Trees, shrubs, all kinds of things. Beaver love to eat crops. They'll go eat corn. They will go eat vintage Merlot wine vines that are very, very expensive and that is not um, going to make friends uh, with the vendors. And so we try to support landowners in protecting their precious trees, crops, or whatever it is through various means. You can fence them, you can put hot wire around them, or you can actually on the right here, this is some very creative sand painting where you literally get a chip of the bark and you go get it color matched with exterior latex paint and add some masonry sand and then you can paint away. So for the artsy folks who want to really get into it, paint your knots and do the whole thing. Um, it's a very aesthetically pleasing way of, of protecting your trees. Flooding is another big concern with beaver. They are trying to create more aquatic habitat and greater access to more food and so they are going to flood where they can if uh, allowed. And Thankfully, we have a device called a flexible pond leveler. And this device is basically, you put a pipe through the dam and you set it at the height you want the pond to be. And then the water flows out of the pipe. And you weight it down so you don't have to look at it. And then you have this cage here that protects the inlet. Beavers are cued to dam and build when they hear or feel water flow. And so this cage, prevents them from being able to hear it or feel it or at least get access to it. So um, they work really well and we've had some great successes partnering with different agencies. Um, El Dorado Hills used to be a big beaver killing area and they have totally turned a corner and are now asking for help and having us come in and teach their community services district. And I don't know if it was the district themselves, I'm not placing blame on them, but I do know, oh, sorry, my screen, um, that there was a lot of conflict going on in El Dorado Hills because they built a big housing, you know, several housing developments in places that um, now have a lot of water that we were taking advantage of. And so this device has been a huge success and they're really excited to put in more. And similarly, Caltrans uh, in Monterey County down in Prunedale, we were able to help them on a project where they had created this mitigation area to um, offset what the road work they had done and now they have these wonderful western pond turtles and red-legged frogs and then beaver showed up and built a dam and started flooding their multi-million dollar road so luckily we were able to come in and help them put in one of these devices as well and it's working great and these devices you don't even barely have to manage. Maybe once a year, just clean out debris and they're good to go. So we do have even more active beaver restoration happening where we're actually working to help the beaver stay put or actually encourage them to expand uh, into other areas. And so we can do things like reinforce their dams if they're getting blown out by high flows, or we can put in these mock beaver dams that you'll hear called beaver dam analogs. Um, the Scott River Watershed Council uh, really uh, was first in the state to get these permitted and have done a lot of great work. This is a coho bearing stream. And so there's a lot of eyes on this project and they've had a 
huge success in helping pond the water and create more habitat for the fish. And the beaver have actually adopted some of their uh, beaver dam analogs, which is great. Right now as we speak, our partners uh, working with the Mighty Summit Consortium that we've been working with as well. Beaver used to be in this uh, Yellow Creek. This is a 2300 acre valley that was just given back to them from PG&E. This is their ancestral homelands of the Mountain Maidu, and now they are getting to steward it and they want beaver back. And so we're helping them uh, put in some beaver dam analogs and other in-stream structures and trying to encourage the beaver to come back. Um, similarly, up in Child's Meadow, this is near uh, Mount Lassen, which is in the background here. Um, there are beaver here, but um, they wanted to do a study on the effects of beaver on biodiversity and carbon sequestration. And so they did this great study and the results are available online and um, they're finding out that indeed, as we know, um, beaver are in fact increasing the biodiversity in this case, especially for willow flycatcher and the cascades frogs that are here. And they are helping to sequester carbon. And we are now working with the Thule River Tribe um, with a project I'll talk about in a minute. Um, here's an example of a great restoration site up in the town of near Lincoln, California, which is in the foothills. And basically here, Placer Land Trust was managing this land and it was just this one single threaded stream and it was pretty dry everywhere else. And they wanted to re, uh, restore this former wetland, but they were having a hard time. And they were killing their beaver because they had heard the beaver were not helping and the beaver were getting after the trees and, and they had uh, adopted that management practice from the earlier landowner. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service showed up and said, hey, we'll help you restore this, but first thing you got to sign a peace treaty with the beaver. So they did. And right away, things started changing and they were still getting some high flows, so they needed to help the beaver out. So they put in these posts to reinforce the beaver dams and it worked. And then they started realizing, well, this needs more space. So how about we break down some of the levee area? And within a four year period, they basically increased their wetted area by 800%. And the beaver are now managing this whole area. It's even bigger now, like you have to go here if you want to get the best beaver reality tour you've ever had, because it's chest high and water as far as the eye can see, and it is full of wildlife now. And everyone's really excited at the, at the outcome. It's exactly what they were hoping for, and they didn't realize that just for $70,000 and a few minor um, adjustments and some of these beaver dam analogs and some reinforcing that they could get this amazing result. So what about the relocation question? Are we gonna, what, what's happening in California? Why is California the only state in the West that is not relocating beaver? Well, I already told you what the, the department's concerns are. And, you know, thankfully we've been given an opportunity that I'm really excited about. And that is we are gonna be working with the Thule River tribe to restore beaver to their sovereign lands. And this is a case where, uh, as long as the department is not willing to allow anyone else to do it on lands that they manage, then we're going to get creative and uh, work with other land manager owners, nations uh, to get this work done. And thankfully, the department has been very cooperative and is excited to participate. And we're going to make it a very scientifically rigorous process and with the intent of of really trying to address the concerns that the department has because for us ultimately we want to make this option available for anyone where it makes sense and it does not make sense everywhere in california it's you know there's a whole art and science to beaver relocation and we've worked a lot with folks from other states to do this i'm here in colorado relocating these beaver in the rockies and up here in washington where we're actually uh, figuring out, determining the gender of beaver, which requires uh, some crafty palpation of their oil glands to determine what, what gender they are, because uh, that's the only way you can tell. So thankfully, uh, beaver hopefully will not have a headache after we, we start relocating them and we can uh, start getting this going in California. We really would like to keep this moving. Um, so my invitation to all of you watching is to 
if it would serve you, become more aware of the beaver and take care of the ones that we have. Learn as much as you can. Uh, Simon already showed you these resources. These are the links that you can go to. You can download our booklet for free. And if you don't feel like reading Eager, uh, which is award-winning and very entertaining, uh, it's also an audiobook, so you can listen to it. Highly recommend those resources. We really would like help mapping beaver. Um, the department is not uh, showing where beaver are. The department doesn't have the resources right now to track where beaver are. And so we're relying on citizen scientists. And if you're familiar with iNaturalist, you can just take photos and either post it on the website, or if you have a smartphone, you can just download the app and do it that way. And uh, if you're worried about the beaver safety, you can kind of uh, blur the, the um, exact location so that people can't exactly go after them. So you can see right here, these are the nearest beaver that I'm aware of in the San Diego area. Um, this is the Santa Margarita River and this is Sandia Creek. Uh, if you don't know Eric Robinson, he is an entrepreneur who's very interested in beaver and has been doing a lot of uh, ad activism and advocacy in San Diego um, to try to help bring beaver back. Um, I know they are down in Camp Pendleton as well. And um, there may be an opportunity there to, to, you know, work with folks if, you know, they're having issues with them to uh, figure out a way to coexist with them. So uh, regardless where you're uh, zooming in from, uh, find out where your beaver are, go check them out. Um, if you don't know what to look for, we have in the back of our booklet all these different kinds of signs, whether it's dams or lodges or tracks or burrows or chewed sticks, even their scat. Um, Check that out and become more proficient in identifying beaver sign. It can be tricky. Um, and there are lots of great groups out there that are doing beaver uh, education that are emerging. This one just emerged in the last year in San Luis Obispo County, uh, the Slow Beaver Brigade. And I'm so excited. They're like bringing out Emily Fairfax to give tours and they're posting blogs and videos of what's happening with their beaver. And so I encourage everyone to um, do this with your friends and, and go out there and figure out what's happening with your beaver. Because we too are keystone species and it would be nice if we could all learn how to act like them and actually put our um, keystone efforts towards regenerative disturbance rather than degenerative disturbance. And so um, it's a group effort and we're all in this together. So I hope you'll join me in this effort and uh, wave the beaver flag. And with that, I will stop and say thank you. Thank you, Kate. You are welcome. Oh, I see all kinds of comments that I was not paying attention to. So most of those comments I was managing and I think we're good on those, but I do see some hands going up. So. Um, John and Sabina, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? You're still muted. It, it was an applause. It was uh, not a applause. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so if anybody else has a question, uh, I see Dennis has a question. Dennis, do you want to unmute yourself? Great talk. I was wondering uh, what characteristics of a stream and the surrounding geology uh, would make it appropriate to introduce beavers? That's a super great question. And so, you know, beaver are again, really adaptable. And so they have been known to set up dams and, and lodges in all kinds of places, but they prefer a slow, you know, they want perennial water if they can get it, though they will they have been known to perennialize uh, intermittent streams. They want uh, a lower gradient, so less of a steep angle uh, if they can get it. And then it's good if they have access to food nearby, they need it within, you know, 100 feet so that they can get at it. And so really, you know, we have, when we're doing these relocation uh, assessments, we look at all kinds of characteristics in a stream. Does it have enough water? Does it have enough depth to start with? Um, for example, they need at least a meter of, of water for escape cover. And are, is there enough of the foods in, in the area? And then materials for them to build. 
we'd like for them, if it's appropriate in the area, uh, we'd like for them to build dams. They can build dams with rocks, they'll use sagebrush, they'll use, um, you know, all kinds of materials. But ideally, you want to give them access to, to um, larger materials like conifers and, and things like that. Um, and again, it also depends on where you are with regards to development. So it's not a good idea to reintroduce beaver into the middle of a city unless that city has a massive park with a floodplain and, and all of that. Um, beavers might show up there on their own as they have. We've got beavers in Denver, we've got beavers in Spokane, we've got beavers in all kinds of cities and they do fine. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Dennis. Yeah, thank you. Okay, do we have another question? If, let's see, I can't see everybody. So if you have one, you can unmute yourself and ask it while you're doing that. I do have a question from somebody who wasn't able to attend. Um, Jason Zagarella says, can there be success in introducing beavers into a stream that is currently seasonal by doing so during the flow season, allowing them to improve dams that humans assist with? Have there been any case studies on this? So as I was thinking, yes, there have been some incidences where beaver have been able to successfully dam systems that have less perennial flow um, to then help retain that water year round. It really depends on the system. It depends on the hydrology and it depends on uh, the climate you know, where you are, but um, absolutely there have been incidences of that. And that's part of, you know, often when folks are doing reintroduction, they're uh, trying to make conditions as conducive to the beaver as possible. And so um, putting in things like beaver dam analogs and, and helping expand the habitat uh, can help in that effort. Ideally though, you know, for me, it's it's a lot of effort like relocation is actually the highest hanging fruit and it's the last resort it's it's an extreme measure um and if a beaver is going to be killed anyway and we have the relocation option sure it'd be nice to be able to, to take advantage of that option but it's not the go-to because right now we have beaver and we are not doing all we can to support those beaver and so that's where i always start and there are places where we have beaver where we could entice them further upstream or further downstream and, uh, and make sure that they're um, being supported you know, where they go and where they need to disperse. They don't have a high, you know, it's about a 45% success rate when they disperse, they easily get preyed upon. And similarly, when you relocate beaver, it can be uh, about a 50% success rate as well where they can get preyed upon. So that's just the nature of being um, a big rodent. There's lots of folks going after you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, um, I should take this off here. I'll do my video. Um, where do beavers go in dry, dry season on a um, smaller seasonal river? Um, if, there, if there are any sources of water that are uh, perennialized near them, uh, such as ponds, uh, beaver are very much known if, if they have to, they can escape into stock ponds, uh, lakes, uh, reservoirs, uh, whatnot. Um, but in general, if they themselves have not been able to successfully stop up enough water in a dry season, in a dry climate, then they are likely to perish. And mm -hmm. it, it does happen. Um, there's a bunch of beaver on the San Inez River near Santa Barbara, and um, they've built several dams. They have over 100 dams on that system in, in good flow years. And um, sometimes, during a drought year, not all the beaver persist and survive, and they have found dead, dead beaver as a result. Because that system does become disconnected uh, in, in, in the dry season. So again, it's very system dependent, but they, they will travel if they have to. How far? The recorded record that I'm aware of is 120 miles overland, which is the extreme in general. It's like the 10 to 20 mile overland or up to 30 miles by creek. Mm -hmm. um, 
they prefer to travel by water if they can, but they don't always have that um, opportunity. Uh, it just depends again on where they are. And here in Sonoma County, our mighty Russian River used to be full of beaver. That's why the Russian were here um, in part. And um, they just finally returned after 139 year absence. And it took them 10 years to get over a hill, a, a small mountain and into the upper tributaries and slowly work their way down over 10 years and now they're in main stem russian river which is really exciting great thank you yeah um i i have a question about the lake pillsbury and and russian river area um they talked about taking the lake pillsbury dam down and I was thinking that this would just be an excellent opportunity for beavers to come in along that the Lake Pillsbury Road and just have at it. I mean, there's there's a huge amount of the Eel River up there. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one question I have is, is that a great place for beavers? And the other question I have is Cache Creek. Um, I have a horse and I ride back in Cache Creek and there is so many areas out in there that I think, you know, it would be perfect for beavers. Um, so anyway, those are two questions I have. You're from Lake Sonoma, or from Sonoma County. Yeah. Maybe you know up around Lake Pillsbury and Cache Creek. Well, Linda, you're already thinking like a beaver because there are beavers <laughs> in the Eel River and in Cache Creek already. And so, um, yes, they, um, I, I'm not sure how close they are to Pillsbury right now. I, I know that they had been reintroduced in there um, at one point. Um, they're near the Van Ars, uh, Arsdale Dam for sure um, on that part of the eel, but they, um, yeah, they, those are perfect conditions for them. There's tons of food and um, enough water to sustain them. Hi, Kate. This is Wesley and Margie. Um, we started out with our interest in beaver about two or three years ago, and we were told first that there were no, no beavers in San Inez River. But thanks to Emily and her work has shown, and these were talking to biologists, and so just recently we were told the same thing for the, the Kiama River. In fact, they made a mural of, uh, of the river with all the wildlife, but they refused to put beaver in because they said that uh, the river was flowing too fast for beaver and intermittent. So Emily's going to do another study for us. We've asked her to do new Ki Kiama River. So let's slowly but surely, we're going to kind of help develop a whole beaver knowledge base in the Santa, Santa Barbara area. So that's what we're kind of behind. And we also just made, uh, Ray Serino just made a five minute movie on beavers that we just showed at, um, at the drive-in when we were showing Kiss the Ground. So we're trying to do a whole education here, but we're building up our knowledge base. So it takes time. So the question I have is, you know, when beavers are allowed to keep, you know, and especially our intermittent rivers and the way our, our whole thing around rain and drought, if they get to kind of just keep building their dams over time, well, that will raise the water table. And I think my feeling is that the beavers will start to have more, habitat even during the really dry season if it's allowed in time so um i don't know your feelings on this you know we're just learning here about it and we've just had emily that's helped us so much you know with that the beaver world is so grateful for emily fairfax and that she finally came back to california and is now doing research here um, so yes, and thank you for all your work in really trying to highlight the beaver in, in your area. I really appreciate that. And you know, we we didn't find out about all those San Inez beaver until we were at a fish conference. And the there, you know, the fisheries biologist for um, the Kachuma water system has to go out and, and monitor those dams every year um, as part of their um, process of, of checking in on how the, the sodium steelhead are doing. And so it was through his work, Tim Robinson, he's great, um, that we found out that there were all these beaver dams on the San Inez River. And I went to UCSB and didn't even realize that. It was like, what? So it's, yeah, it's people, it's, there's so many silos 
people don't even know that there's like a thing that people are wondering where beaver are. And so that's why we're really just trying to get the word out of like, hey, this is a thing. We actually need to know where they are. And, um, and so in answer to your question, absolutely, beavers, they need food and water. And so they're going to manipulate the water to grow their food. They're willow farmers. And that's part of why they're, you know, backing this water up and willows like their feet wet, as do cottonwoods and all the different species that beaver like to eat. And so through their dam building and canal digging, they are creating these waterworks systems that are like chinampas. They're like incredible wetlands that are supporting all of this vegetation. And so absolutely, they are going to create more food for themselves. And if the system is limited, sure, they can, you know, it's cyclical. Beavers are like any disturbance. They come in, you know, and depending on the habitat, it'll dictate what the cycle is going to be like and what the timing is going to be like. If there's just a little bit of willow, they might eat it all and then move on. That willow will grow back and then they might come back. Um, so it just really depends. And, you know, it's also important to consider too, like what is the, the terrain like and you know, do you have bedrock or do you have soils that will absorb water and all of that. There's lots of different things that go into it, but in general, sure. If, if there is enough initial food and water to keep beaver around, then they're going to do everything they can and they've got a whole colony of workers to help them grow their food and maintain that riparian vegetation. So Kate, we're a little over time. There, there are two hands that have been up for a while. So if I have plenty of time. Okay. Um, so let's take those two questions. Um, I see Chris Mitchell has his, his or her hand up. Let's see Chris Mitchell. Um, so Chris, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, let's see, you're still muted. I think you just turned your camera off instead. Camera's back on, but you're still muted. <laughs> can see you, <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember being a freaking visitor to Escadillo during, during my seminar's residence, resident days, residency day, residency days. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember visiting. Yeah, I remember being a freaking visitor to Escadillo during my days living in San Marcos, or Marcos, that's resident. That's my hometown, San Marcos. We're so, very happy to have you here. And did you have a, a question about beavers for Kate? So what, what, what do beavers do? What do beavers do? Well, we, so Kate has this very wonderful book here. And anybody that wants to learn more about beavers, I really encourage them to get this. You can get it for free online, um, or you could get it, get a hard copy from their website. Um, I'm gonna post Kate's email address in the chat there. And let's see, we had one more question, or maybe not anymore. I'm um, from Military San Diego, Neural Samuels, Nylumnus. We're happy to have you, Chris. All right. So, all right, I'll see y'all later. All right, take care, Chris. Thanks for joining Good us. <laughs> Good night. Um, I thought I had another question, but it looks like it is gone. So if anybody has any further questions, I, I have Kate's email address in the comments there. You can also see it on the slide. Um, we really want to thank everybody for joining us. Again, I really want to encourage everybody to check out this wonderful handbook that Kate wrote. Um, thank you all very much.